The extended journey of the two Starliner astronauts has seemingly become a memorable tale in space history due to the extremely high level of danger that could have befallen the astronauts involved in the mission. Many might assume that the astronauts ultimately survived and returned, but in reality, the trip was far wilder than most of us could imagine. Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams faced hundreds of questions about what would happen during the flight when the Starliner spacecraft began experiencing issues. I don't know that we can come back to Earth at that point. I don't know if we can. And as a matter of fact, I'm thinking we probably can't. These were the words expressed by Wilmore, a Starliner astronaut, in his first interview since returning to Earth aboard a Crew Dragon two weeks ago. Honestly, any astronaut would feel the same way when their spacecraft encounters problems, even though they know the title of astronaut doesn't allow fear to take over while they're working. But being aboard Starliner brought a different kind of anxiety. First, this was Starliner's first crewed test flight after years of delays, and past test missions had consistently run into issues. I know the astronauts wouldn't publicly admit this on the media, but imagine being in a vehicle with no prior successful track record. Wouldn't you feel anxious? During the interview, Wilmore shared that he had met with several senior Boeing executives beforehand, including the chief engineer, Naveed Hussain, the chief engineer of Boeing's Defense, Space, and Security Division, asked Wilmore what his biggest concern was. Wilmore expressed worries about the thrusters and valves, as these issues had occurred in previous orbital flight tests, OFT. He also feared that losing thruster control could leave them stranded in space, unable to maneuver. It's an understandable response to be anxious before a flight. But shockingly, the very problem they had anticipated actually happened. Starliner lost thruster functionality during the flight. This must have hit the two astronauts, floating in space like a psychological thunderbolt. But that wasn't all. The loss of thrusters forced Wilmore to manually control Starliner's trajectory. This was nothing short of a nightmare for the astronaut. Wilmore recounted the struggle to control Starliner when the thrusters failed at a perpendicular angle, requiring him to carefully devise a workaround. And, oh my, the control is sluggish. Compared to the first day, it is not the same spacecraft. Am I able to maintain control? I am, but it is not the same. Essentially, with four thrusters down, Wilmore could no longer fully control Starliner. Yet, the mission had to continue. Abandoning the docking attempt wasn't an easy option. Just as the thrusters were critical for controlling the spacecraft during docking, they were also essential for positioning Starliner for the orbital burn and re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. So, Wilmore had to weigh whether approaching the space station or attempting to return to Earth was the riskier move. Williams shared the same concerns. In this situation, the two astronauts aboard Starliner grappled with a great deal of despair. There was a lot of unsaid communication like, Hey, this is a very precarious situation we're in, Williams said. Wilmore, choking up, added, I don't know that we can come back to Earth at that point. I don't know if we can. And matter of fact, I'm thinking we probably can't. Yet, continuing to pursue docking with the ISS remained their only viable choice. But, due to the cascade of issues that had already occurred, docking with the ISS was far from straightforward. One of the additional challenges at this point, beyond maintaining their position relative to the space station, was keeping Starliner's nose aligned with the orbiting laboratory. I can't believe the two astronauts had to endure such extreme, second-by-second -second tension. But thankfully, they ultimately reached their orbital lifeline. When asked about their feelings at that moment, both astronauts candidly admitted they didn't believe they would return home aboard Starliner. Wilmore said, I was thinking, we might not come home in the spacecraft. We might not. This is an entirely understandable thought, given the immense stress they faced during Starliner's troubled ascent. Yet, Despite this, NASA and Boeing continued to express confidence in the spacecraft's safe return. After the incident with the Starliner CFT mission, intense debate has been sparked among spaceflight experts regarding the spacecraft's safety and feasibility for returning astronauts to Earth. A major point of contention was the apparent disparity between Boeing and NASA's risk assessments. NASA maintains strict human spaceflight safety standards, requiring a 99.8% probability of a safe return, a benchmark Starliner reportedly failed to meet following its propulsion anomalies. 
This discrepancy likely played a decisive role in NASA's decision to return the astronauts via SpaceX's Crew Dragon rather than Starliner. Steve Stitch, NASA's commercial crew program manager, expressed ongoing concerns about the propulsion system's irregularities, warning that current fixes might only address symptoms rather than the underlying cause. His comments underscored lingering uncertainty about Starliner's long-term reliability, even as Boeing and NASA worked to resolve the issues. A NASA briefing in August 2024 further exposed internal disagreements regarding the thrusters' performance in a crewed return, revealing that confidence in Starliner's readiness was not unanimous. Independent analyses heightened concerns over the spacecraft's operational viability and Boeing's ability to deliver a consistently reliable vehicle. In contrast, SpaceX's Crew Dragon, having demonstrated a strong safety record, intensified pressure on Boeing to prove that Starliner could meet comparable standards of performance and dependability. While some experts acknowledged that spaceflight, especially test missions, inherently involves risk, they also emphasized NASA's stringent safety protocols. The prospect of requiring another crewed test flight raised concerns about the program's future, with fears that additional costs could put Starliner's viability in jeopardy. A spaceflight expert from Johns Hopkins University noted that while a rescue mission was unnecessary, since Starliner was technically capable of returning, NASA opted to delay the flight to gather more data, particularly due to unexpected thruster malfunctions and a reported fuel leak. The expert further suggested that Boeing's pre-flight testing protocols may have been insufficient in detecting these issues before launch. The situation underscored a broader challenge. NASA's risk tolerance varies depending on the circumstances. In an emergency lifeboat scenario, the agency might accept higher risks than it would for a routine crewed return. This distinction highlights the complexities of human spaceflight and the heightened scrutiny surrounding the Starliner program as it struggles to meet expectations and restore confidence in its reliability. However, to be honest, NASA has not been immune to lapses in caution when carrying out missions. NASA has a history of undertaking high-risk missions under pressure, and the Artemis program is no exception. The decision to proceed with Artemis II, sending a crew aboard the Orion spacecraft to orbit the moon, despite unresolved issues with the heat shield, life support systems, and the limited flight history of the Space Launch System, SLS, raises serious concerns about safety and decision-making processes. Unresolved heat shield issues. The Orion spacecraft's heat shield, critical for protecting the crew during re-entry, exhibited unexpected erosion during Artemis I. Rather than redesigning the shield for Artemis II, NASA opted to fly the same design with minor modifications, changes that, according to some analyses, may exacerbate the problem. NASA's interim solution involves altering the re-entry trajectory to mitigate erosion risks, but this approach remains untested in actual flight conditions. Notably, the models and simulations used for Artemis, one failed to predict the erosion observed, casting doubt on the reliability of current analyses. Charles Camarda, an aerospace engineer and former shuttle astronaut with decades of experience in thermal protection systems, argues that NASA has not fully understood, let alone resolved, the heat shield issue. He compares the situation to flaws in the space shuttle program's decision-making processes, pointing to deficiencies in NASA's risk assessments and simulations. Camarda has also highlighted internal dissent, noting that many engineers involved in the analysis disagreed with the decision to fly the unmodified heat shield. Official statements claiming no objections to the decision may be misleading, as dissenting voices were reportedly not formally consulted. A redesigned heat shield intended to address the issue is not slated to fly until Artemis IV, without prior uncrewed flight testing. Besides, the Orion spacecraft's Environmental Control and Life Support System, ECLSS, essential for sustaining the crew, also raises red flags. Artemis I did not include a functional ECLSS, meaning critical components like CO. Two removal systems have not been tested in space. For Artemis II, NASA plans to rely on an untested ECLSS, which will be used for the first time by astronauts in flight. In contrast, SpaceX rigorously tested its Dragon 2 ECLSS on the ground before crewed missions, highlighting a stark difference in approach. Compounding concerns, 
testing of ECLSS components for Artemis, three revealed valve failures in the CO2 removal system due to a design flaw in the control circuitry. NASA's December press briefing suggested the valves themselves were also partly at fault. Alarmingly, this issue went undetected during Artemis II's assembly and partial testing, exposing gaps in quality control and testing protocols. While the flaw was caught in components for a later mission, its oversight in Artemis II's systems suggests other potential issues may remain undiscovered, posing risks to the crew, the Space Launch System, SLS. The rocket-powering Artemis has only one successful launch to its name, Artemis I. NASA's own standards for commercial launch vehicles require at least three consecutive successful launches to certify a rocket for high-priority uncrewed missions, such as Class A, e.g., Europa Clipper, or most Class B payloads, e.g., Psyche. Yet, SLS is deemed safe for a crewed mission after a single flight. This discrepancy suggests either a double standard between NASA-owned and commercial launch vehicles or an inconsistent application of safety criteria for crewed versus uncrewed missions. The plan for Artemis IV, which involves flying a crew on an SLS Block 1B with a new upper stage and other design changes, is even more concerning. These modifications mean Artemis IV's SLS will not share a common configuration with prior flights. Under NASA's own guidelines, it would not qualify to launch even a low-priority Class C robotic mission, requiring one successful flight, let alone a crewed one. Beyond specific technical issues, broader concerns about quality control and workforce competency persist. Reports of subpar quality control at Boeing and an underqualified workforce at NASA's matured assembly facility, where SLS is built, further erode confidence in the program's readiness for crewed missions. A pattern of risky decisions. NASA's decision to move forward with Artemis II, despite these unresolved issues, echoes past instances where pressure to meet deadlines or demonstrate progress has overridden caution. The heat shield's untested fix, the unproven ECLSS, and the SLS's limited flight record collectively represent a high-stakes gamble with astronaut safety. While NASA has promised a redesigned heat shield for Artemis IV, the lack of uncrewed flight testing for critical systems and the apparent dismissal of internal dissent suggest systemic flaws in the agency's risk assessment and decision-making processes. NASA's history of bold missions is a testament to its engineering prowess, but the Artemis program's current trajectory raises questions about whether ambition is outpacing prudence. The agency must address these concerns transparently and rigorously to ensure the safety of its astronauts and the success of its lunar ambitions. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.